All right, hello and welcome to chapter eight. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the topic of photosynthesis. So what kind of organisms go through photosynthesis? Let's start by talking about the types of organisms we have out there. We have autotrophs and heterotrophs, where troph refers to nutrient or feeding source, and auto refers to organisms that can fix carbon. They can, for example, take carbon dioxide from the air and turn that into some kind of organic solid carbon molecule like glucose. Heterotrophs cannot fix carbon. They have to get their carbon source from another organism. For example, by consuming or eating another organism and getting their carbon source from that organism. Looking at autotrophs, there are two types of autotrophs, photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. So I already know autotrophs can fix carbon. They turn carbon dioxide into some kind of organic carbon molecule. Photo refers to organisms that can get their energy to do this from sunlight. And these include plants. We have algae and cyanobacteria, a type of photosynthetic bacteria. Chemoautotrophs cannot go through photosynthesis. So in order to fix carbon, they get their energy source from some kind of inorganic compound. And these include, examples include these thermophilic bacteria um, that are found in deep sea vents, for example. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, include organisms like animals and humans, fungi and bacteria. These organisms get their carbon source from an autotroph, from some kind of autotroph. For example, in our book, they say that the predator who is going to be eating these deer will get their energy ultimately from the vegetation, the plants that the deer consumed, and then will eventually end up within the predator. So photosynthesis and the reaction for photosynthesis is essentially the opposite of the reaction we saw in chapter seven. In photosynthesis, we're going to use light energy to synthesize sugars that we can use to store energy or to use um, in order to power the reactions, such as those that happen in the mitochondria. So during photosynthesis, our inputs include carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and the products include sugar, such as glucose or similar carbon compounds, and oxygen. If I look at the picture from our textbook, I can see water is an input. Water is taken up by the roots and transported up to the top of the plant. The leaves can absorb sunlight through chlorophyll. And carbon dioxide is fixed by these plants in order to make glucose. And oxygen is released as a product. From the previous slide on the left side, we saw that water is absorbed through the roots from the soil and CO2 comes from the air. So how does CO2 get into the plants? It turns out that on the underside of our leaves, there are small pores, and these are called stomata. Stomata, and these can actually open and close in plants. Unlike humans, our pores always stay open. They don't close. So stoma is the singular version of stomata. And if I look at two of the stomata over here, I can see that what allows them to open or close are cells called guard cells on either side of the stoma. So here these are, this is a closed stoma and this one looks like it's an open stoma. CO2 enters through those stomata and oxygen, the waste product, exits through those stomata. Also, finally, we need sunlight. So sunlight will be captured in the chloroplasts of the plant. Our textbook poses this question, on a hot, dry day, the guard cells of plants will close their stomata to conserve water. What do you think will happen to photosynthesis in this case? So if they close their stomata, I know that CO2 levels will go down because they're not picking up new CO2. And the waste product will go up over time. So overall, this will inhibit photosynthesis. And at the end of chapter eight, we'll talk about how plants might get around this. And our California Academy of Sciences has created this really nice animation. If you go to the PDF of our slides, cut and paste this link into your browser. 
It shows us a really nice animation taking us through the structure of the leaf into the stomata and into the chloroplasts of these plants where photosynthesis takes place. Here's kind of a summary of what that animation shows, although it's not as pretty. But if we have leaves here on the underside of the leaf, I know I have those stomata, the pores, with guard cells that open and close, allowing carbon dioxide in and oxygen out. If this is the cross section of the leaf here, I can see that in the central region of the leaf, the primary cells we have are called mesophyll cells. So each of these green kind of oval-like cells, that's one mesophyll cell. If I zoom in and I look at just one mesophyll cell, I see there are tons of these little green packets in them. And each of those green packets is a chloroplast. Here they're zooming in on one chloroplast that we talked about during exam one material. Like mitochondria, they have two membranes with an intermembrane space in between. And inside where the liquid portion is, the stroma, we have these membrane stacks called granum, singular, or grana, if it's plural. And these are called our thy thylakoids. So each of these, these are our thylakoid membranes. Here is another look. This is really a true image that's been colorized. It looks like a transmission electron micrograph image where I can see this is the chloroplast and I have my thylakoid membranes. The reason these are depicted as green, these thylakoid membranes, and over here as well, is because that's where our chlorophyll, our pigments, will be found. So let's look at the structure of the chloroplast again. We have two membranes, the outer and inner membrane. And I can see that here and here. The stroma, again, is the liquid or the fluid part within the chloroplast. Be careful not to mix it up. Stroma with the pores on the underside of the leaf. Stoma versus stroma. Grana are stacks of thylakoids, and that's the plural version. One stack of thylakoid would be a granum, and these are the thylakoids. I can see I have a stack of them right there. Here's another stack. Inside the thylakoid lumen, so that's the space inside the thylakoid. We call that the lumen of the thylakoid. Remember that only plant cells that go through photosynthesis will have these chloroplasts, uh, these organelles. And they're mostly found in those mesophylls, those middle leaf cells. So there are actually two metabolic pathways that comprise photosynthesis. And the first pathway are known as the light reactions. Sometimes these are called the light dependent reactions, light dependent, and these directly use light. The second set of pathways are sometimes called the Calvin cycle, also known as the Calvin Benson cycle. Sometimes they add that second scientist's name in there. Sometimes it's called the light independent pathway or the dark reactions. And this is kind of a misnomer because even though these or the second pathway does not directly require light, it cannot work. It does not work without light because the Calvin cycle depends on the products generated from the light reactions. So photosynthesis really happens within that organelle, the chloroplasts of our mesophyll cells. And if I look at how this picture is organized, I can see the light reactions are happening on the left. And these light reactions occur in the thylakoid membranes of those chloroplasts. What happens is the light will be captured directly in the light reactions. And products of light reactions include ATP and my high energy electron carrier NADPH. The Calvin cycle sometimes also known as the light independent reactions, occurs in the stroma, the liquid portion of the chloroplasts, and requires the use of the ATP and NADPH generated from the light reactions in order to produce our organic carbon molecules, our sugars. I can see that CO2 is also an input here in the Calvin cycle. 
So how do plants get energy from light? I know from physics that light is a type of electromagnetic energy that is composed of photons, which behave both as distinct packets, but also waves. When I look at light, if a type of light has longer wavelengths, so a wavelength is either measured from crest, the crest of one wave to the next, so that's one wavelength, or you can measure it from a trough to another trough, such as from here to here, so that's one wavelength. If you have a longer wavelength where the crests are further apart, these are low energy. There's less energy in long wavelength light. Whereas if you have short wavelengths like this, this would have higher energy. But we can actually only see a fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible portion. And plants also happen to use wavelengths in this portion of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. So in that visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers in terms of wavelength, remember the longer the wavelength, the lower energy, and then the shorter the wavelength, the higher energy, then we can actually use this energy to excite electrons from ground state to a higher state of energy. Um, the energy levels or the wavelength levels below 400 are usually too high and would end up damaging the cells. And wavelengths longer than 700 nanometers are usually too low in terms of energy to excite electrons. So this is a really nice range that can allow the excitation of electrons to do some work within the cell. So we're going to see in a few slides later that in the ground state, we have an electron in some kind of lower energy shell, lower energy state. And when photons, when light hits these electrons, they can excite the electron so that they travel to a higher energy, higher energy state. And that can be used to do work later on. Here we zoom in on the electromagnetic spectrum from the visible range, and I can see low energy is about 700 nanometers, and that's what we detect is a red light. We see red light for these low energy wavelengths, and around 400 nanometers is our violet, kind of purplish light, so that is high energy. And another way to remember this, our book says, if you imagine you have a piece of string, it does not take that much energy to make waves like this in our string. But if you wanted to make these small wavelengths in the string, you would have to move your arm up and down really fast and it would take a lot of energy to do so. The reason our chloroplasts generally appear green is because of the pigments found in the thylakoid membranes within the chloroplasts. And these are primarily chlorophyll A shown here chlorophyll B, which is very similar to chlorophyll A except for the presence of this functional group, and beta carotene, and here a type of carotenoid. If I look at chlorophyll A and B, the absorption spectrum for these pigments, I can see they primarily absorb in the ends of the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of the visible region of light. So they absorb reddish orange and bluish purple but they don't appear red or bluish purple because the appearance of the pigments include what they do not absorb. So any wavelength of light that is not absorbed is reflected or transmitted through the leaf. And that's why these leaves are primarily green. These wavelengths of light pass through and that's what we see. Beta carotene on the other hand is a type of carotenoid and carotenoids, if I look at their absorption spectrum, let me change colors, it looks like they primarily absorb in this region and they do not absorb over here. So the reason carotenoids appear usually red, yellow, or orange, red, orange, or yellow, I should say, is because they absorb in the green, blue, and purple region, but they do not absorb red, orange, and yellow, which is why these light or these wavelengths of light are reflected and transmitted and 
uh, for example, carrots and oranges that have a lot of beta carotene appear that orange or yellowish color. Other examples of carotenoids include lycopene, which generates that red color we see in tomatoes, and Z axanthins, which generates that yellow color of corn seeds. So I know that pigments absorb very specific wavelengths of light, and each pigment has a unique absorption spectrum. And through this absorption spectrum, we can be able to tell what pigments or what wavelengths of light they use for energy and what color they're going to appear, which is what they do not absorb. All right, that takes us to the end of the first video. In the second video for chapter eight, we're gonna look at the biochemistry of photosynthesis, including the light dependent and light independent reactions.